I loved your simple way of storytelling. I thought it was so elemental, especially the low angle shots that you got. You really felt connected with water, in fact, and, mm. and the earth itself. Can I ask you a question about the sound? How, how, do you, how do you actually approach the sound? Do you actually record, you, do you record on site or do you add to it? How do you enhance it? What's the process? We, we don't record the sound while we're filming um, because you, we just can't have that much equipment and people around. But what we do is when we've got a scene, when we know we've achieved a scene, we then make sure we pick up all the sound for example, the atmospheres from that time, of day, that time of day, that location, that weather, that whatever else. And then we'll pick up um, isolated sounds as well. So, for example, if we know that um, there were cicadas at one, one moment and we want to bring that in and fade it out again so we can play with it. So we'll pick up all the elements that we need for, in this case, Wounded Buffalo, which is a company in Bristol, to actually build the soundscape for us. So. It sounds from the wild, and it's from the places, but it's entirely recreated. And I suppose it's about, about, we know what the atmosphere, we know how we want that atmosphere to sound, we know how we remember it, and we're kind of rebuilding that. And I think there's a question, yes, Raven. Thanks, I'm Ali Bradburn. Just wanted to know how enamored you really are with 3D for wildlife filmmaking. With 3D? Um, I, think it's, I think it's fantastic because I can't, for me, um, as I tried to say earlier, it's uh, the technology, I want, that, I want it to be simple so I can just get on with using it creatively, okay? But it, it isn't and it hasn't been yet and it no doubt will have a you know, bit longer when it isn't. But I think the end, what is possible in terms of immersing your audience, my ideal is to tell a, a really good 90 minute wildlife story but actually happen to have immersed the audience in the place where that took place. And at times have it in their lap, but not too overtly, just enough to kind of, like you might love a scene in any film because of its color. You might love it because it had a certain depth or it, you played with the depth in a certain way. So it's kind of just like a tool that adds another layer to your experience of that film. Now, if, it's a, if somebody said to me, you can't make another a 3D film for two years, will you make a 2D film? I'd say definitely, because I want to make films. But I think the potential for 3D, I mean, for me, the horror, which I find very difficult to watch, but again, it's because you either do or you don't want to be there, you know? And so horror, wildlife, and probably porn are, you know, are, are subjects which really lend themselves. You don't have to kind of ask yourself, is this a, will this drama work? You know, I think they just basically will work once we all master the techniques and we, in, we keep the standards as high as we can. My biggest fear for 3D is um, lack of budgets and then people being so desperate to do it, you know, like we all want to do it, but not having the facilities to, to do it as well as we could. And then everybody's saying, oh, it's not really, you know, much good, is it? And going off it. Um, but I don't know what will happen in that direction. Yeah, because I think we, I've worked for Parthenon and we're making a 3D wildlife polar bear program at the moment. Mm. But because it's being funded, um, that people are trying to get as much as they possibly can from it. So they're trying to get a 2D version and a 3D version from the same footage, which yes, is possible. But then also saying, well, you don't need more time in the edit and you don't need to be doing this, and you don't need to be doing that. But I think actually they're two completely different programs that you need to be making. <coughs> I think if you saw, I mean, to me, it's really interesting. To me, a year later, this is a bit slow in 3D, and I knew it would become slow, but I knew at the time we were editing it, that was the pace we wanted it in 3D, because we were kind of, we were all, and I don't mean just us, new to 3D, and you could kind of revel in it a bit. Um, it'll speed up, just as 2D viewing has sped up so that we can interpret images incredibly fast compared to what we would have done 30 years ago. Um, but I think that... Um, the whole thing of 2D, 3D does demand a different pace. And if you watch that, when we sent this to Guy Mitchellmore to do the music, we just sent it to him in 2D. And we've worked with him for years and years. And he said, uh, I hate to say this, guys, but, you know, are you sure this is the right pace? Isn't it, you know, a bit slow, boring? And we, we said, well, in 3D, no. You know, and so I think there is a danger of the 2D, 3D I issue. 
Um, and I think they are different things. I also think the whole thing of everybody doing everything ev ever faster is, I mean, you, we don't think faster. And my biggest thing, when we moved from editing on film on Steenbex to being able to do digital editing, and suddenly we were expected to edit a, something in half the time because the technology was faster, nobody had time to think about it in the same way. And I mean, that may sound exaggerated, but in the end, it does wear away at the quality and detail of things. You know, if, if you're good at doing something and you have a bit more time and you're not rushed and you can really think about it, you probably will take it make a better thing and so I think any pressure on time and budgets is it's not great but I know it's everywhere. Well, we've time for one very quick question and then we need to take another break please. I, sorry I thought did you not have your... No I was just going to say um, please don't cut it any quicker because um, what's okay. really what was really impressive about that was that we had the, you know we had the time to to look around the shots. Yeah. And that's what 3D really allows you to do. It just gives you so much more to process. And um, well, that's interesting to hear. I think it's because I've watched it so many times and I'm kind of thinking, oh God, is this boring? You know, better hurry it up. Um, <laughs> rather than having it, experiencing it for you know, the no, first it's time. Really, it's really engaging at that pace. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually, well, that's interesting. Um, if it was quicker, it would be to its detriment because it, would, yeah. you know, it wouldn't allow you to, it wouldn't allow the audience to to really absorb what they were, what they're watching, and there's a lot to take in there, yeah. you know. I mean, for, with wildlife, it's such, it's going to be such an interesting play between being there and telling a story, because you know, for a lot of people, it is going to be the closest they ever come to being. You know, I mean, who sees an elephant's trunk like that when it drops down into? That's my favourite shot: is when the elephant's trunk drops down into frame, and you, it's as if you're lying in the grass, five inches from it. No, whoops, nobody ever, you never get in that position. 2D doesn't let you see it like that because it stacks it up on the end of a, a long lens. Suddenly you're seeing things and experiencing them in a way actually you wouldn't even do in the wild if you were there. Um, so I'm, I think it's so exciting, this play between being there and storytelling. I think that's the note on which we have to bring this session to, to a close. But again, Vicky has kindly agreed to stay for the panel, which starts in about 13 minutes' time. We'll be sitting down there. So again, Vicky, thank you very thank you. much for sharing your thinking. Thanks.